Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Yurai and uh, I want to talk to you about uh, some experiments that we do um, in uh, making ourselves more free in a project called Parallelpolis, uh, which will hopefully be on the screen soon. Uh, and um, what I would like to um, do today is to introduce you uh, to the projects and some uh, approaches and how we are thinking about it. So, Parallelpolis is a house in Prague. This is, uh, this is uh, uh, the first uh, space that we had. Um, uh, now we have Parallelpolis in Bratislava and uh, Barcelona. There's a project in uh, Vienna and Kosice as well that is uh, starting these days. So we are trying to uh, bring and create these temporary uh, houses of freedom in different cities uh, in a decentralized way. So you can think, uh, think of it uh, maybe as a concept of either a hackerspace or a fab lab or uh, things like this that have some kind of identity. They're called something. They have a set of values, uh, but each of them is independent and run by a different organization and different group of people. Um, so the house in Prague, just very briefly, consists of Bitcoin Coffee, which is the first crypto-only cafeteria in the world. Uh, uh, the mobile version is there in the back. You can visit Bitcoin Coffee also here. And uh, this is... Um, where we introduce people to cryptocurrencies, to this uh, way of life and these parallel structures. Um, uh, then there's co-working space uh, called Paper Hub, Institute of Crypto Anarchy, which is uh, uh, basically an educational institution and uh, think tank. And we organize a congress called uh, Hackers Congress Parallel Polis, which is a crypto anarchist conference. Uh, so, just very briefly, this is how the house in Prague looks like. Um, this is the Institute of Crypto Anarchy. Um, and uh, roots of this um, uh, idea, uh, it's basically two roots. One is uh, um, uh, uh, Crypto Anarchy and Crypto Anarchistic Manifesto. The second one is a philosophy called Parallel Police. Um, just a short introduction um, during the totalitarian regime in Czechoslovakia. Uh, people wanted to be more free, so they uh, realized, uh, the philosopher Václav Benda wrote it in a, in a paper, uh, that for example, okay, we have to go to these totalitarian schools and we have to send our children there and they're going to be educated in uh, Marxism, Leninism and uh, you know, their way of life. Um, but nothing uh, says that in the evening we cannot bring the children to the kitchen and educate them in something else. Um, so it's a way to um, build these parallel structures, in, in this case parallel education system, um, in a way that is not in direct conflict uh, with, the, with the mainstream society, in this case the totalitarian regime. Um, so it creates a parallel solution that can exist uh, uh, in parallel to, uh, to this uh, official or mainstream one. Uh, Crypto Anarchy Manifesto uh, introduced this concept uh, um, in virtual spaces on the internet. So people would create these chat rooms, uh, they would have anonymous uh, identities, end-to-end -end encryption, they started using digital money. Uh, even before Bitcoin, there were several uh, digital currencies. And uh, you basically do the same thing, but not in a physical space, like a kitchen where you educate children, but in a, in a virtual space in a way that's encrypted and uh, in some cases anonymous. Um, very good analogy um, uh, that will uh, explain how conflicts work because it's in a way um, conflict with the in conflict with the mainstream society. It's called the UDA loop. Uh, the UDA loop is uh, uh, basically a set uh, of four stages that uh, both conflict parties um, uh, execute in a loop. 
so first they observe, so they try to understand what is happening, um, then make some meaning, what it means to them, uh, so uh, that's the orientation phase. Then when they have enough data, uh, they uh, can use the data to decide uh, on the next action, and then they act. Uh, so the OODA loop uh, is interesting because uh, most of the uh, people who uh, try to improve their freedoms, uh, they uh, uh, attack um, the, the two last uh, steps of the OODA loop. So, uh, for example, uh, if you want to attack the uh, decision part of the OODA loop, you can change the law, you can appeal to constitution, you can uh, um, protest, lobby and so on, in order to change the rules of the mainstream society. So the decision is in your favor. So that's how you attack the, the de decision phase. Um, other parties, uh, they try to um, uh, uh, attack the last uh, step, which is act. So, for example, uh, if you are in a squat, uh, you barricade yourself and you make it very difficult for anyone to enforce the de decision upon you. So they cannot actually act or they, um, uh, you make it hard for them to actually act against you. Uh, for example, if, you, um, uh, uh, if a judge decides that you should be sentenced in prison for the rest of your life and you escape, um, this is also attacking the action part. So what is interesting about crypto anarchy and what we are trying to do is that we um, attack the first two parts, not the, not the last two parts. So by attacking the observe part uh, in crypto anarchy, you use end-to-end -end encryption, you use, um, uh, use anonymity. So you make it very hard for other people to observe what you are doing. So if, they, if no one knows what you are doing, then it's very difficult to, uh, uh, to kind of judge it and uh, make action uh, about it. If they know uh, what is, uh, uh, if they can observe that you are doing something, but they cannot make sense of it. So for example, you're we wearing masks or someone just sees encrypted info, uh, communication, but they don't understand what the communication means, that's att attacking the orient part and uh, that makes it, uh, um, for example, one of the ways how to attack is, uh, uh, this part is by making uh, the actions not attributable to uh, a certain person. So for example, on the dark market when someone is uh, selling uh, uh, something, uh, you can maybe observe the, the, the interaction, but uh, because everyone is using pseudonyms, you don't know uh, what that means and who they are. Uh, another inspiration for us is Hacking Bay's Temporary Autonomous Zones. Uh, it's a really good book. Uh, there's a also a um, uh, a music version, so something like an audio book, but also with music by Bill Laswell. So find it on YouTube. It's very nice. Um, and um, temporary autonomous zones is a is a way um, uh, by which you can uh, live as if you are free, because you are at least at the place and time free. And there are many ways how you can attain this uh, status of living in a temporary autonomous zone. So for example, uh, there are private music festivals and techno parties. Uh, they are temporary autonomous zone because uh, you announce the location, which is on the private land on Friday, uh, 6 p.m. So there is no judge to sign a warrant. There's um, no way how this, uh, how for example, police can organize to come to this place and uh, uh, do any kind of attack. So this is a one weekend long temporary autonomous zone where people do various uh, interesting things that are not allowed in mainstream society. Uh, ethnical minorities, they have a, uh, in a lot of cases a temporary autonomous zone. For example, Vietnamese or Chinese communities often uh, solve their disputes internally, so they would never go to state court in case they have any kind of trouble um, among them. So they try to uh, solve these issues internally. Uh, famous are secret societies and uh, 
uh, even uh, mafia and gangs, which are not ethical, but they kind of create these temporary autonomous zones for themselves, also by attacking the UDA loop, because if you are um, part of the gang, that means that you needed to commit a crime in order to become. Uh, there's a rite of passage. Uh, and um, it is very difficult to infiltrate uh, uh, these organizations. Uh, so, as I said, we are building these um, zones and we are trying to increase our autonomy. Uh, so, right now, um, we are open sourcing the concept, uh, which is not very well documented yet, but you can start your own parallel police and we will help you with everything that we know. Uh, there are some very basic rules. Uh, for example, um, you only um, accept uh, decentralized non-state money. Uh, but uh, we would like to help bootstrap these parallel societies. So this is um, a building in Bratislava, Slovakia that we have. Uh, it's the same idea, different physical space. Uh, there's Bitcoin coffee and uh, and it's our, uh, it's our temporary autonomous zones. Um, when I was talking about uh, the UDA loop, uh, the conflicts are not always with the state. Uh, in our case, the conflict can happen uh, with the neighbors. For example, if you uh, organize a party that is too loud, uh, which uh, is not a nice thing to do uh, to your neighbors, but uh, conflicts can arise from uh, something like that. You can have um, conflicts with the landlord, with the city, because you are missing some stamp or something, um, or the state. And um, it is very difficult to um, be autonomous in a permanent physical space, because uh, these spaces can be surveilled, they can be observed. Uh, y people usually don't wear masks, so... Uh, uh, so they are a clear target for anyone who wants to uh, uh, start their UDA loops, let's say. And uh, it doesn't scale well, because if you want to create a new activity within the space and you suddenly need a new room, uh, the limitation is uh, the four walls, so you cannot just, like in a virtual space, uh, space spawn a new container and run your new applications inside that container. So that's why we um, uh, are thinking about containerizing the physical space by using shipping containers. Um, this is another project by Parallelpolis in Prague, uh, which is a mobile version of Parallelpolis in a decent track. So it's a mini version that contains everything, Bitcoin Coffee, Institute of Crypto Anarchy. So there are a few cities in the world that don't have parallel policy yet, so <laughs> uh, they can be served with uh, decent track. Um, um, but uh, this has several problems. Normally you don't want to move uh, uh, once a week or something like that. So there's a lot of frozen capital because you need to maintain the motor, there's a license plate and, and so on. So um, achieving scalability, modularity and semi-permanence um, is uh, by this wonderful invention, which is a shipping container. A shipping container is very easy to move. Uh, you don't lock your capital in a physical building. You don't, uh, uh, you don't, uh, you know, build insulation that you can cannot take with you. You don't um, build physical uh, spaces in a way that uh, that are locked um, in the in the particular physical space. Um, uh, what is nice about shipping containers, it's they're not that easy to attribute. They don't have license plates. It's a metal box that you can uh, put somewhere. Uh, it's totally common. Shipping containers are everywhere. There are locations like ports where they're full of shipping containers and um, uh, they're quite anonymous, so they make it hard um, uh, to observe what is happening. You can stack them on top of each other, which is... Um, good way to extend your space so this is the transcending the limit of the four walls because if you for example want to uh, for, uh, in Bratislava we wanted to um, introduce virtual reality uh, so uh, in this case you can r 
literally buy a new shipping container and uh, start a really small business providing virtual reality. If you have new idea, you want to do hydroponics or something like that, you can just buy a new shipping container and do it in there. So it's very easily scalable without uh, raising the costs of rent and so on. Um, my inspiration for this talk uh, is a temporary autonomous zone called TAZ0, which is in Berlin. Uh, I highly recommend um, the Cypherpunk Bitstream podcast. Uh, you can find it on taz0.org. They talk about uh, these things in detail. So uh, I think the average duration of the podcast is three hours. <laughs> So uh, I highly recommend it. Um, and uh, they also organize cypherpunk meetups in Berlin in a shipping container village. So if you're interested in this, uh, check, uh, check their website. Uh, the, this is one of the rare cases how you can visit this temporary autonomous zone because it's not public. Uh, but these uh, meetups are public. So um, they have a shipping container village um, uh, that consists of six shipping containers right now. They have the public space, uh, co-working, meeting room, uh, gym <laughs> uh, in a shipping container. So uh, this is where we kind of, or at least me, uh, where, where I try to learn about these, uh, uh, these ideas. Uh, Okay, this slide doesn't work, but um, what I wanted to show you uh, is that we are in Bratislava, Slovakia. Um, and uh, Bratislava is right on the border with uh, Austria and Hungary. So uh, by creating this village in shipping containers, what we can achieve if we have problem even on the state level is we can load the whole village on trucks, move it 10 minutes by car and we are in a completely different jurisdiction. What is nice about the, this is that uh, in this moment uh, the most interactions with the uh, state are completely reset, like you reboot the machine, uh, they lose state <laughs> um, and uh, everything begins again. So, um, so basically we can move every, uh, let's say, four or five years to a different jurisdiction. So at the time when we come back to Slovakia, we are all already old news and no one remembers us. Also, the question is who is us? Because there is a guy that has a shipping container, there is another guy that has a shipping container and there is no single entity, no single someone to, um, uh, to deal with. Ah, okay, there's, there's the slide actually. Um, so yeah, this is Bratislava and these are the borders with uh, Austria and Hungary. So, um, so mm -hmm. um, also uh, uh, these zones are super modular because uh, as I said, every startup can just pay rent, uh, but be independently financed, uh, independently managed. Uh, there, are, there is no need for like a huge central uh, decision making uh, regarding these modules. So if someone wants to start a, a kebab stand in a shipping container, hamburger stand, uh, a bicycle repair shop, whatever people want uh, to do, uh, we welcome it because uh, uh, it's... Um, 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 it's enhancing our life because we get access to more services. Uh, we believe that these independent uh, businesses around us would also accept cryptocurrencies because they will be influenced by us and it's kind of hard not to if you are surrounded by crypto anarchists that uh, uh, talk for half an hour if you um, uh, want them to pay in fiat. So this is the easiest way to make them shut up about their uh, philosophy, just accept their Monero or, <laughs> or their Bitcoin or whatever. Uh, as I said, the space can grow around us um, and we can have different rules for different zones. So some can be totally open to public, some, ca some can be 
completely private. Uh, uh, as Nassim Nicholas Taleb said, good fences make good neighbors, uh, but also trade makes uh, good neighbors. So if your neighbors feed you every day with their super gluten-free hipster hamburgers, then you are friends and they, they, they are friends with you because you pay them in a really nice anonymous currency. Um, what to build inside these shipping containers? Just very briefly, there are many options uh, what you can do. Uh, but you can start, uh, for example, parallel healthcare providers. I would really like to see a stem cell treatment uh, clinic in a uh, high cube, uh, 40 feet shipping container. That would be uh, really cool and you don't need much more space. Um, um, maybe intravenous bar would be a good uh, cypherpunk idea in order to load yourself with antioxidants and vitamins. Um, uh, you, can, you can imagine many other things. What we are already doing is we are using parallel financial systems, which is really good because many of the rules of the current uh, system are enforced through the financial system. So for example, um, there is not so much new regulation about offshore businesses, there is some. Uh, but most of the rules uh, are actually enforced by the, uh, by the banking system. So, for example, if you want to start a bank account for a company that's owned by a Panamanian resident and it's from Cyprus, then they make it really hard to do. But if you generate a new uh, cryptocurrency address, you can do business and you're not breaking any laws. You just do uh, uh, what the companies are meant to do. Also, inflationary tax is very easy to avoid using uh, parallel financial system. Um, uh, you can create uh, local pop-up economies, which is what we are experimenting with now. We started uh, an internal token that is not an ICO, it's not, uh, not any uh, shitcoin properties. It's um, a way to reward our vol volunteers and then they can then use the token inside of uh, our spaces. So uh, if you want uh, some inspiration, Burner Wallet is a really good project uh, that creates these pop-up economies. Uh, also, Script uh, is, a, is a good new idea how to transfer um, uh, value. So, um, with cryptocurrencies, uh, I think the most important property is the network effect. Uh, but uh, that doesn't mean that it needs to be a global cryptocurrency. Because if you are in a shipping container village and you know that you can pay with a local token, it has the network effect of the village. And if you are physically there, then, then you can use it anywhere uh, that you want. Um, so this, uh, okay, so this is an invisible picture of uh, Parallel Garden. This is a visible picture of Parallel Garden. You can create these hydroponic systems. There's Radim who's sitting there, um, uh, who is one of the authors of this project. It's an open source hydroponic system, so you can grow your food in the shipping container. And um, uh, um, last question is, okay, you don't have courts, how do you enforce rules? So that's very easy. First of all, you make sure that being part of the village um, um, benefits the people. That means that they want to stay in and if they break the rules, if they don't uh, get along with someone, um, they get kicked out and that's very costly. So if you do business with the people within the village, uh, you're lowering transaction costs, then people actually want to settle disputes because they want to stay part of, uh, part of the community. Um, if you d don't get along uh, with some people on a personal level, which always happens, if there are more than five people, you can be 100% sure that two of those won't get along that well. Uh, just switch to a market API and uh, you don't need to uh, go to lunches with that person and uh, you know uh, drink and party with them. Uh, you can just uh, you know pay for their services and uh, uh, you don't need uh, uh, close interaction. So, uh, last few pictures. Uh, uh, shipping containers are perceived as something that is very small. Uh, you can really build huge structures with shipping containers. Um, 
this is a total must have that we uh, are including in our first uh, version plan which is a sauna in a 10 foot shipping container so this is one of the services that you can use um, you can create token that you can sweat out in a sauna uh, so it's proof of sweat uh, coin which is uh, uh, very useful and it brings the community together and that's my presentation and I welcome uh, your questions thank you Hi, thanks for that. Uh, I was interested to know if you have any more examples around parallel healthcare, where that's worked or where you've seen that be really successful? Um, yes, healthcare is very, um, a very broad topic. Uh, so there's health insurance, there's healthcare providers, there's medicine. So uh, Regarding medicine, for example, there are dark markets where people buy their medicine from countries where the medicine that they need is not regulated. One example would be getting CBD, which is illegal in Slovakia, uh, which is one of the, the probably the only country in Europe where CBD is illegal. Um, so you can get it somewhere else. Uh, there are many cases of people uh, who are buying medicine, uh, for example, because um, it's not allowed uh, in the US, but it's allowed in Canada or vice versa. Um, so access to medicine is one, one case. Um, healthcare providers, what is very important to realize is that the world is big and uh, the healthcare market is big. So there is no reason to just because you were born somewhere to use the healthcare system of that particular pl place. Um, so there are uh, places where you can get much better treatment. For example, uh, I'm a resident uh, in Panama. Uh, Panama has really good uh, uh, stem cell therapy treatments. Uh, people go to dentists uh, to uh, Thailand or uh, Latin America. Uh, so. Um, it is, uh, I think the best uh, from the individual perspective is to just look at the world as a big open market where you can access healthcare. Um, of course, parallel healthcare uh, doesn't mean that you have to choose uh, among the official providers. Uh, you, can, uh, you can go visit some crazy doctor wherever they are and uh, give you an IV of some super new CRISPR treatment, which hopefully soon arrives. Uh, so, yeah, and travel insurance, there are, uh, uh, sorry, uh, healthcare insurance, there are many global players in this uh, market and it's quite easy to switch them. So, any other questions? Yes, there's one in the front. Uh, hi. Hello. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, so I was wondering how do you go about funding? Uh, is your economy already strong enough to provide for itself or do you have donations or do you just pool your money together? Um, so our funding is very diverse. <laughs> uh, so uh, we charge uh, for coffee. Uh, we uh, sometimes charge, uh, depending on which place we are talking about in Bratislava, we've, uh, we have entrance fees to our events. We have um, membership fees, we have uh, members of the board who pay a little bit more uh, and they help us finance this thing. We get sponsorship, so uh, basically we try to get as much funding as we can. Uh, the only exception is that we don't take state or European Union money. So we are completely private fund funded, 100%. Um, sometimes some small crypto speculation pays off, which is uh, usually by accident. Uh, most of the time we screw it up. <laughs> um, but that's one of the ways that, uh, that it works. Uh, we also used collateralized loans. Uh, so we were locking in crypto and borrowing money in order to finance something when crypto was low and we were waiting until it goes back up in order not to lose the value. So. Um, this is a very wide topic, but uh, um, what is nice about the, the shipping containers idea though is that you can also decentralize funding because you don't need to 
uh, go to a donor and sell them to this idea of a whole new parallel society, you can say, oh, we are growing salads <laughs> in, a, in hydroponics and finance this and it's one shipping container, these are the costs and uh, you can do that. We uh, also recently started doing crowdfunding campaigns which were quite successful and we were quite satisfied with the, with the results as well. So uh, uh, with funding I would say go white <laughs> and try whatever works. Okay, I think we should uh, stop here. I will be around here and uh, uh, of course close to the coffee machine so if you would like to talk to me uh, I'm, I'm around and thank you very much. <laughs>